Hello and welcome back to the Diet Temple podcast with me, filmmaker Charlie Steeds. Every film director has their signature, from John Carpenter's synth scores to Tarantino's explosive violence and Mario Bava's use of gothic multicoloured lighting. Some directors also have their signature actors, like Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro, and in my far lesser known humble B-movie world of Dark Temple, I have my own signature actor in Barrington De La Roche. Barrington is a legend among the people who work on my film sets, a larger-than-life persona you're unlikely to forget once you've encountered him, and across the past five years of filmmaking, we truly need to talk for hours to fit every adventure we've had into a single podcast. In fact, despite the weeks and months we've spent on set together, Barrington has still never run out of bizarre anecdotes and insane stories to keep us all entertained on and off set. In this interview, we often veer off into talk of witches' covens, encounters with the devil, Barrington's brief time in prison, and other parts of his colourful past, and still it barely scratches the surface of the tales Barrington has to tell. To any sensitive listeners out there, I warn you it's definitely about to get weird, and I hope you'll come out of this interview with a special appreciation, love and respect for a true one-of-a-kind. Here he is, Barrington De La Roche. So let's start by who is Barrington De La Roche? God. <laughs> or the devil. Yeah. Um, Barrington De La Roche is a free spirit. Even as a child, I've never been uh, restricted by my parents, by school, by society. I was a rebel. <laughs> I've always been a rebel. I still am. I've, I make up my own mind about everything and anything. I'm free. I revel in that freeness, in that freedom. And that's one of the reasons why I was so attracted to you. Mm -hmm. Because you had your own... I I said to you once, um, I was interviewing you once. Yeah. And I said to you, how do you make films? And you said, I don't know how to make films, but I know how I make films. (laughs) And and it's that sort of freedom that we both have. Yeah. But I think that we work so well together. No, that's true. I, and, I, and I still sort of believe that. Like, I, I know how to do things my way, but yeah. not necessarily the way. And, yeah, I guess you, you are also uh, very similar like that. When did you decide then that acting was something you wanted to try? Like, what was it that first... What made that first idea come into your head, acting? Well, first of all, I only know how to do things my way. <laughs> yeah. I'm not very good at doing things other people's way. <laughs> but acting, I've I've always been an artist. I've, I've always been good at drawing. Mm-hmm. And when I was at school, I've always loved film. Mm-hmm. It was one of my favourite things when I was a child was going to the cinema. And, uh, and when I was at school, I've always been a bit of a control freak as well. But during the playtimes... I started doing the Three Musketeers one. And we were just a couple of friends. I was D'Artagnan and I picked my Three Musketeers. Suddenly everyone wanted to be in my, in, in my game. It was like the playground game. <laughs> and this was at infant school. Yeah. So I was only just five or something. And that's when I realised that I could be quite a good director. Mm-hmm. That's now I run my own theatre company with performance art as opposed to theatre. But I still love theatre. And then your move into acting in stuff on screen, when did that actually begin? At one point, I did a few music videos. I mean, in the 60s, there's some music videos. But there was more important things in my life other than even more than my art up mm. until I was um, up until I was 42 I was 
I was a kind of on a real rebel path. <laughs> yeah. I was an outlaw. I was an outlaw. I lived outside the law. I lived outside normal society. Right up until I was 42, mm. until the change in my life. Because I went to art school when I was like 17, but I got thrown out for being disruptive. <laughs> what were you doing that was so disruptive? Just acting up, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, instead of doing a painting, I actually painted one guy's face. <laughs> and he didn't like it. I mean, it wasn't with his consent or anything. <laughs> Again... I didn't, f- I, I didn't try to fit in. I didn't try to follow the rules. Mm. I mean, when I was a child, I had a real battle with my father. Mm. If you told me to stand up, I'd sit down. If you told me to sit down, I'd stand up because I didn't want to be confined. And I felt one of the main problems mm. was because when I was a child, I was so inquisitive and it, were, and it was always, why? I'd be told to do something. Why? And I was never given a reason, not a valid reason, why? Mm, mm. I'd ask, what does this mean? And no one could tell me. Mm. Not my parents, not the school teacher. They couldn't tell me on a level that I expected. For me, everyone was stupid. It was just conforming for the sake of conforming. Yeah, no, I didn't conform at all. I was a drug addict for up until I was 42 years old, from from very young. Mm. Um, I started drinking alcohol when I was very young. Mm. I mean, it was an exciting life. I loved it. I smuggled, I was smuggling. I was, life was really... Everywhere I went, I took drugs with me, no matter if I was changing countries. And people used to say to me, drugs are no good for you. They gave me a year to live in 1965 <laughs> if I didn't stop. I said, well, I'd rather have a year of this anyway. <laughs> and, and here you are. And here I am. <laughs> so nothing really um, changed till I was uh, 42. Mm. And then after a couple of years, I thought, right, what do I want to do in my life? And the reason I changed was because, because I, thought, I thought drugs gave me everything. Mm. They gave me power, they gave me security, and they gave me excitement. And I never I never had a day without taking them. So uh-huh. they were my life. Yeah. So then at 42, I got clean. Big shock. I mean, actually getting clean, when I did get clean, it's like being on acid for a couple <laughs> of years, just being clean. Yeah. But then I realised that because I was into black... When I was using, I was into black magic, so I thought it gave me power. I was always... I was a seeker. Mm. I was always looking for something. And I thought I found it in drugs. I thought I found it in black magic. I, but the reality is that those things are just illusion. Mm. So then when I got clean, I had to really look to see what I was, what life meant to me, what I was about. So I went on a journey of self-discovery. Mm. I'm, I am a spiritual person. I'm also what I realised, because I was so tricky when I was using, and I'd take advantage of everybody, I'd use everyone. So in my mind, when I was using, I was quite evil, in mm. my own mind. <laughs> and yeah. people used to say, oh, that I was evil. <laughs> So even when I was a child, my great grandmother, my great grandmother used to say, "That boy, I never lived to go to school. <laughs> that boy's got the devil in him." So really, even the drugs was a path of self-discovery. I've always mm. been on a path of self-discovery. Mm. When I was very young, before I started school, um, we lived in the East End of London, mm. and it still had an outside toilet. So. I used to get up in the night, go to the toilet, there'd be a full moon. I'd, I'd full moon bathe. <laughs> and then I'd full moon bathe naked. <laughs> and then there, at the bottom of our garden was a railway station. Mm-hmm. And I used to watch the trains in the middle of the night going by the goods train. It seemed they were really high off the tracks, but I used to really... I had this vision of laying between the tracks and letting the trains... 
So I did it one night. <laughs> I lay between the tracks, let the good strains roll over me, and I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, oh, it was amazing. You've just always been attracted to sort of <laughs> danger, <laughs> danger, extremes of experience, yeah. extremes of life, mm. pushing the limits of things. I mean, even when I was using, I studied different religions. I studied, I looked at yoga, I looked at meditation. And then when I got clean, I really got into it. And I went back to art school. I, I wasn't just painting, I was sculpting. I was in every department. I was in the film department, I was making films. But my work was so way out. Even when I was at college, I did a residency in a medical school and with the cadavers. I've seen your little scrapbook of pictures from your medical days. Yeah. Quite disturbing. So I took the brains out and put flowers in. I took the intestines out and put fruit in, fresh fruit in. <laughs> Which I've seen the pictures of, so I know you're not lying. Yeah. <laughs> so I was always on a journey of exploration. The galleries weren't really interested in my work. They thought it was too controversial. Mm. I had to earn some money. I had to find a way of making a living. Mm. So I got an agent called Ugly. And they wanted me. Mm-hmm. So I went with Ugly, and uh, then I got another agent, then another agent. I ended up with like 10 agents yeah. for doing modelling, uh-huh. extra work. You were, what was the advert? You were in the hot tub? Oh, that was Gucci. What do you remember of the, uh, the day we first met and you had your audition? Well, I just got a part in a, in a short, mm. a horror short, where my character was tied to a chair and set fire to. <laughs> so to get in the role of the character, I wrote a poem mm-hmm. about me being the fire. And me be... So when I went for my casting, I said to you, can I sit down? And you were sitting there behind a desk. And I pulled my chair up and I sat in front of you and I did this poem I'd written. <laughs> and your face was... <laughs> <laughs> Probably shock and it's fear. Quite amazing. <laughs> and then I said to you afterwards, you were like silent. So I said to you, would you like me to do it again and you can direct me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said, yeah, do it angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a, it was a casting. I was at film school at the time. I would have been nineteen, um, and it was a casting for um, a short film of mine, God Will Fall. It was called. And I was casting for the role of this Satanist. And I'd had the casting already. You weren't available on the days where, where I was actually doing the casting. And I had, you know, the table and I had the camera and I had friends of mine who, from the film school who were to make up the casting panel watching all these actors. And we saw these actors come in. And then I remember, because you couldn't make the casting, you <laughs> like text me a couple of days later like, can I still come? I still really want to audition for you. So I kind of forgot about it a little bit, but then I remembered, oh yeah, I got this guy Barrington showing up uh, this evening to come and do a casting, but I didn't have my camera, I was on my own, I didn't have friends, um, so it was just you and me. You were the only person that day who, were co- who was coming in for an audition because they'd all been and gone. But at the same time, I wasn't going to say no to you because you had... You have such a distinctive look and character about you that I wasn't going to turn down the opportunity to see you. Um, and yeah, all I remember was um, you. Uh, I remember you got out of your chair and you crawled across the table and you were staring right into my eyes and you were reaching out for me. <laughs> you were like you were trying to terrify me in in the audition room where it was just me and you. Um, and in fact, that's kind of a pet hate of mine is when when you audition actors, if you're there for like four hours, let's say, and you've got actor after actor after actor coming through, it's actually it's quite exhausting as a as a casting director. It's exhausting to watch these people and interact with these people. And one of the most exhausting things is if they're acting and they stare into your eyes that exhausts me because it's like you have to interact with that person it's like uh it kind of makes you a little bit awkward and that's what you did from the get-go but in this case it worked because you succeeded in you know sort of frightening me and captivating me and showing me what you could do 
so you got the part and uh, we went on to make God Will Fool. Um, in the film you played a Satanist. In the audition you told me that you were a Satanist. Well, again, because I don't follow rules, mm. there were a few black magic groups. There was a witch in Notting Hill who wanted me to join his coven. There were people who always wanted me to join their group. Where did you find these people? <laughs> oh, I don't know. They come out of the woodwork. <laughs> But um, I would never join a group. Yeah. I was my own, I was my own master, mm. master of my own destiny. I was the magician. Mm. I suppose if, if I um, appreciated anybody, it was Alistair Crowley. I named my cat Crowley. I, I looked it up. There are books. Crowley's written books. There's The Golden Dawn. They wrote books. Um, I was very interested in, because the Nazi, their whole system was based on black magic. Mm. And I was very interested in ritual magic, where you get the iron, the red, you draw, you do the five star, you draw the forces of Mars. In fact, I was in prison once. Yeah. In fact, the first time I was in prison, I was on remand. And there was a red bedspread. And at night... Because I was on the I was on the mental wing, the nutters wing. Yeah. <laughs> Every time they put me on remand, they put me in the nutters. I mean, even the police were afraid of me. <laughs> and you could act, at that point you could see there was one night that you, I knew you could see Saturn with the naked eye. It was mm. one of the rare moments because Saturn's quite far away, but you could see it with the naked eye. Mm. I had my red bed spread. The the, the bed was iron because they were in those days. I cut, out, I cut out five-sided stars with my fingers out of toilet paper, because <laughs> it was the old toilet paper. It wasn't soft tissue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I stuck all these five-sided stars to my maroon bedspread, which is red, you need red. So I climbed up on the window of the prison cell, wrapped in this, with the five stars stuck on with soap. <laughs> holding the metal and I was looking for Saturn with the naked eye. <laughs> and the prison guard who was doing the night round probably, he, ch he saw me. <laughs> he said, what are you doing up there? I said, I'm looking for Saturn with the naked eye. <laughs> he must have thought I meant Satan. He said, I'm looking for Satan. With the <laughs> because I was on remand, yeah. they locked the door. Mm. Your door is locked 24 hours. You're banged up in the cell. You just have three times a day mm. where you're given exercise 10 minutes a day yeah. three times a day they left my door unlocked <laughs> and I had all these oranges injected with methadrine which is a liquid amphetamine and I was like going around the prison <laughs> I was on the block yeah. just going around giving everyone these oranges <laughs> so everyone was like space, everyone was like out of their heads <laughs> and what were, what were you in prison for Barrington? It was normally because I had so, so many drugs. I was registered private doctors. And I had these carry bags full of drugs. And they always <laughs> used to try to think, but they were legal. I wasn't actually doing anything illegal. Mm. But I just had so many drugs. And how many times did you get put in prison? On remand, you mm. have to remember, remand is not prison. 20, 30 times on remand. <laughs> and then I did one actual prison term where I spent... Christmas in prison. Mm. And what was that for? Do you remember? Um, I think it was for receiving stolen goods. You used to be into a bit of your stolen goods, didn't you? Well, I, I used to swap drugs for them. We've made films on the subject of the supernatural and I wondered if you'd ever had any sort of extreme or scary experiences with supernatural incidents in your life? Not really, but I've met the devil, and the first time I met the devil was in this house that I was renting in Putney, this huge house, and in the dining room it had all this ebony carved furniture, as huge, and we were having a seance one night. And nothing was happening. And we told people we were having a seance, so we had an audience to watch our seance. <laughs> and, and nothing was happening, and everyone was getting tense, everyone was on drugs. And suddenly, 
because all the people who were watching, I thought that they might be laughing at us, saying, oh, look at these. So I used all my powers of concentration. And because I knew something was in this house, I knew there was an energy there. Mm. I mean, everybody that lived there or came in knew there was. Mm. So I just wished, now the chandelier, this big black, huge ebony chandelier, I just wished it would crash through the centre of the table. <laughs> I was just, and I was winning it to crash through the centre of the table. Winning it, winning it, winning it. And we were all sitting under high back carved wooden chairs. Yeah. Where the table was really high, the, the arms of the chair were under the table. This guy suddenly somersaulted through the air, landed on the table, spun around like in um, like the head spun round. In the, <laughs> the exorcist. But his whole body spun around, came back, faced to me and said, oh man, don't do that anymore. <laughs> and the room was empty. They'd all, they'd <laughs> they'd all fled. Out. Yeah, they ran. <laughs> So you told me once that you were actually friends with the devil for a time. Is this the same place where... No. No, this is a different place. But I went back to that place. Mm. I took Inessa because I wanted to show her. Mm. And the house that was there is gone because mm. the garden was so big they built like a an estate mm. with about 20 houses on it. Mm-hmm. But there was one new house like right at the front that kind of next door where our house would have been. It's called Barrington's Court. Named after Barrington. Yeah. <laughs> the place where I said witches wanted me to join. Mm. Well, I lived in this one house in Linden Gardens in Notting Hill Gate. Mm. And the landlord had three houses. And in one of the houses was a coven with this witch, <laughs> Alex Saunders. <laughs> yeah. And all the housekeepers... Well, witches. Mm-hmm. And I did the... And I was out of my head on stuff. <laughs> and I did these drawings. And the housekeeper, he was really interested in in me. And I had my first son at the time, who was born on 10 to 12 on Friday the 13th. <laughs> I showed him my drawing. And he said he wanted to show them to this witch, Alex Sanders. Well, I let him show them. This Alexander said, oh, these are witchcraft. These drawings are witchcraft. And I, said, when he came back and told me and he wanted me to join the car, I said, no, they're not witchcraft. They're mine. <laughs> this is my head. This is my, my mind. Mm. They're not witchcraft. Thank you very much, but I don't want to... <laughs> because I knew that, that everyone was naked, jumping around over fires while Alex Sanders controlled the energy. Mm. I didn't want someone else controlling my energy. Yeah, yeah. So I said no. So then a battle started. <laughs> and the battle started, he sent spells at me. <laughs> yeah. And he made the whole room electric. Uh-huh. But in this room in Linden Gardens, which there was a fabulous energy, one night I called for Mephistopheles and the devil came. And he could come any time I wanted. The energy, obviously now I know it was my energy, mm. but it was for me the energy. So And it made me invincible. Mm. So this witch and his coven trying to break my spirit, they had no chance. <laughs> so when the devil or Mephistopheles came to you, how did you know it was there? Was it just an energy? Yeah. That you, ju- you just felt the energy. But I, there was like a lampshade in the middle of the room. Mm-hmm. And I'd just throw a blanket over it. And it would go into a certain shape. And I'd go, welcome. <laughs> what and sort I, of shape? A devilish shape? No, it's a shape like a, a, a spirit. Mm-hmm. It was just a shape. Because there was a light. And it was covering the light. And it would go. And the blanket would pull it down one side. So it's like a hooded, vowed figure. Mm. But it would be there. And I used to play the, the Doors' Strange Days. <laughs> yeah. People are strange when you're a stranger. <laughs> and the Faces devil. Come out the devil the liked a bit of the Doors. Yeah, he loved the Doors. <laughs> but whenever I, and whenever I played that album, I could summon up that same energy. 
let's go on to the subject of my movies. So you're quite unique among my actors because you've known me since I was a teenager. You've kind of been here right from the beginning of my sort of transition journey. into making yeah my journey my transition into making feature films for the first time you were even in the short films you were in a film school project even um i want to know what your first impressions were of working with me we were in tune mm. i knew that right from that first audition mm. i knew we were in tune because i said to you things like david lynch i love david lynch mm. i've met david lynch I've met him twice. Uh, he invited me to come to one of his lectures once. He says to me, hey, Barrington, buddy, I've got a goal now. <laughs> no, but I, I was in tune. I was in tune. I loved his film. Also, I've met Werner Herzog. Mm -hmm. That's when I gave him a kiss on each side of his. <laughs> but I love Her Herzog. I think Herzog is a genius for me. Mm -hmm. I like them. And that was my type of filmmaking. I've never really been into horror mm -hmm. because it was never really... Fri I mean, for me, horror. I mean, the nearest thing to a horror. I mean, Psycho was good. Funny Games. Mm -hmm. Is that psychological? Is that real horror? Yeah, yeah. For me, because I find your films very amusing. <laughs> but what I noticed with that first script mm. was that the way you wrote the script... You drew these characters out, mm. and your characters were many faceted. They weren't just a simple. Mm. There was a real depth to the writing and the way you directed, and your presence on the film set. So, my my attitude is, all right. I've got this thing. I have to do it my way. I have to do it my way. But if I agree to be in someone else's film and they're directing, then that's the contract. Yeah. I have to try and see what they want. And that's the only area in which I do that, <laughs> yeah. is if someone's directing. I thought, this guy has got so much potential. You really have a chance of, you know, making it, mm. not, not necessarily making it big time, which I think you do, but you really have the energy to do what you want to do mm. in filmmaking. I threw myself into it. Mm. And then here we are, seven or eight years later, we're still working together, we're, you're still coming back to the productions. How is it that you've stuck around so long and that we're still collaborating and, and what's worth coming back for after all this I time? I love you. <laughs> the way you've made your films on mm. the budget you've had, mm. which is in the beginning we had no budget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just amazing. Mm. I just thought I just thought you were amazing what you achieved with your limited budget because you you were under restriction. Oh yeah, definitely. So. I I think people forget that that there is this extra added element of a huge thrill of working with a low budget that is in itself its own challenge you know people obviously they give so much sort of praise to the higher budget productions but you also at the same time or some people forget that if it's such a high budget production they've got all everything they need they've got it's all provided it's all easy answers it all comes so easy you know, that, that there's actually the effort and the creativity doesn't actually need to be there. It's just provided to you. And I know that even from going from almost zero budget projects to what we're at now, where we have still a very small budget in the terms of the whole industry, but it's significantly more money, tens of thousands more than we ever had in the beginning. Um, and the more money you have, the easier everything becomes because money just solves the problems. But um, still, at every, every stage of the films that we've made together, budget has been this huge limitation and you have to be extremely creative and, and face such challenges to try and get around it, you know, it, which is, it, it's, it presents this whole new fun element to the filmmaking process but you've actually succeeded in doing that because everybody everybody that watches your films 
including me, because they don't look low budget. Mm. People can't believe that you've done it. Even the ones at the beginning on no budget. And well, well, this is true. I mean, even people now who you know might might uh, write a review of my current movies and say, you know, clearly this is low budget. Clearly, this is you know tiny budget. Just the fact that on this budget, you can actually watch the movie from start to finish and even be remotely entertained is an achievement that ten years ago or twenty years ago was probably almost impossible at this budget level. Uh, it's amazing the technology that's come along um, and then the simple techniques you learn from having to make things on a low budget again and again and again. But also you use lots of the same actors mm -hmm. who all love you and believe in you. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps. You've got like an ensemble. Yeah. When people understand and believe mm. that what is possible then their energy changes. Exactly. And your films are high energy. Mm -hmm. And it's high energy on set, but w one of the other things about being on set is it's such great fun. Yeah. I mean, everyone is loves it and they're enjoying it. And I think that's important as well. Mm -hmm. I've what are you doing? I've always had a philosophy that the more fun you have on set together, the better the end product turns out to be. I don't know why those two things correlate, but they really do. Mm. If you kind of have a miserable time, even if you've like prepared it and you've got the money, it's still it, the film still comes out kind of dull and miserable. But if you have really good fun on set, then it always turns out to be a good fun movie. Um, so for me, it's, it's always been important to create an opportunity and, a, and a, a whole experience for the actors and the whole crew to all enjoy this experience together, you know. The, you always say to me and everybody, enjoy it, play yeah. with it, <laughs> yeah. play with it. And it works. Mm. I mean, I think that's, well, as I said before, if you love what you're doing, you're going to be good at it or you you're going to be successful. So, I mean, I love working with you. Yeah. And um, as I just said, this new script you've just given me, uh, I said, I think it's your best one. Mm -hmm. But every one. You say it's <laughs> your best one. Well, we're always, I think a lot of filmmakers at this sort of level, you know, it's, it's easy after. I mean, I've only been making feature films for, I think, almost five years now. Um, and it's easy to sort of get a little bit... Um, disheartened with the industry and you sort of just you you find where you're sitting and you just sort of you coast along at that level but I'm all I'm all for you know always trying to build you know build upon what we've done before bigger experiences bigger films going bigger and better each time it's the only way to sort of develop and increase and grow you know what we're doing well let's talk through the different roles that you've played for me Right. There's been many. Yeah. Do you think you can remember all of them? Yeah, of course. Go for it. Well, first there was... Um, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> Balfour. Balfour, the Satanist. Again, that was c close to my heart because it was a path that I'd been on one. Mm. So I like the, the ritual... I like the same filming thing. satanic rituals yeah. at Elin Studios together. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was called Balfour because my the head of my year group at film school where I was at the time was called something Balfour. That was his surname, Balfour. And when I first got to the film school, my thing was I wanted to get filming right away. I was so excited to be in Ealing Studios, and I'd ask yeah. them really specifically. Do you have kit? Do you have studio space? Because I make a short film two or three times a year, four, four or five times a year even. I'm always making short films. And when I come to film school, I want to make sure I can still do that. Mm. Um, and I went for a meeting with this guy, Balfour, who was the head of the year group. And he literally sat me down and told me, while you're here, you cannot make films. Like You shouldn't be making films. You shouldn't be making films in your short, uh, short films in your spare time. You should just concentrate on the lessons. Don't worry about filmmaking. You don't need to know anything about it. So 
and I was so infuriated that the head of the year group at this so-called film school would tell me not to make films in my spare time, which was what I did with all my spare time. So he was named after, (laughs) he became Balfour, the head Satanist evil villain in my script. Which we, which we filmed there. I caused such a fuss at that film school. They, they were never happy with me using studio space, s- taking out equipment in the, on the weekends. They always seemed to have a problem with me doing anything there. Mm. But there we were, making a little satanic ritual <laughs> in the middle of Ealing Studios <laughs> in their little film studio by hanging what was it red silk curtains in a in a ring i wanted to i wanted to rent out a proper cathedral or something you know like a ruined cathedral well, it looked like a lynch set anyway <laughs> yeah with the red bit, bit of artistic license mm. <laughs> And then the next one was Cannibal Farm. Well, the next one was a film school project we did that never saw the light of day. But um, it was still a film that we shot over 15 days and we spent 15 grand on the budget, which wasn't too bad. Um, And you played some sort of care... Some sort of janitor at a health spa with an evil secret. Yeah. But we ran around. You ran around with that huge knife thingy. I did, didn't I? <laughs> then it was labyrinth. I, I yeah. like the scene in the air vent where I go through. Where I played it like a spider with the blade, <laughs> with the rubber blade version in my mouth. You were crawling through the air vent with a foam knife clenched in your teeth. Yeah. And the direction was like a spider. <laughs> then there was um, labyrinth, yeah, which I thought. <clears throat> that was a whole concept film for me. Yeah. Because we were in four by four tunnels. <laughs> so the acting and everything had to take on a different um, format. Because mm. we were so restrained. And I thought it was actually invigorating. Mm. And I found a lot of freedom in being so restrained like that. Once you had your knee pads on. Well, I had to have my knee pads on. <laughs> again, when I had to go fast, I did it like a spider. <laughs> and you played the evil Emperor Ramesses. Yeah. But what I loved about that one, what, what is it? The song I sing, Fee Fi. No, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sing something. Um, uh, it's uh, Once I Caught a Fish Alive. It's oh, that yeah. song. This little finger on my right. Did you let it go? Because it bit my finger so. Which finger did it bite? This little finger on the right. Seems they've left you behind, Tegu. Left you with your father. Then there's Cannibal Farm. I love Cannibal Farm. Cannibal Farm was from Labyrinthia and everything we'd done before. We suddenly took a big step up. Finally, we had a movie that, before we shot Cannibal Farm, our film Labyrinthia had actually sold on the film market. And we then, for the first time, knew that they were going to be out there. They were going to be released to the masses and that people would at least be watching these movies. And you played the farmer, Hunt Hansen. The Cannibal Farmer. The Cannibal Farmer. Yeah, and there's a scene I love in that where... um washing the skeleton's feet mm. my ex-wife and it turns into the real mm. person that's, I think that's a beautiful scene I think that's one of your best performances I, I did at the time and I still do think that's one of your best moments of um, having a heart to heart with a skeleton because you're actually and, and I feel this way about all the actors I work with or the ones that keep coming back anyway you're very diverse in what you can do People naturally assume Barrington, he's scary, he can be the scary guy, he can do sort of freaky things and creep you out. But that's why I really purposely wrote a character that was kind of a bit more rounded and we could have scenes like this where you have an emotional heart-to-heart with a skeleton sat across from you, the skeleton of your dead wife. I've missed you. I can't stop myself from thinking about the years you were here. Like some lost dream, you forget just as you awaken. But I awoke 
far too soon, Beth. I wasn't done dreaming with you. Then we did the House of Violent Desire. Yeah, that was interesting as well. Well, we went out to the south of France and, and stayed. This was unusual circumstances because we stayed together for 23 days while we shot the whole movie. I think that paid off. Mm. It's a very different sort of dynamic, isn't it, mm. to all be together. Yeah. Like a little troupe of actors. Yeah, it's like a theatre company, oh. all together. Then was the barge people. Right. Very small part. <laughs> small part, but you're playing the typical creepy old man, mm. which I think you were kind of born to play the creepy old man. There was a smaller part in this one. Then was Winter Skin. Yeah, I love that. I love the character, my character. It's almost like he's a goodie. He is a goodie. I mean, he's in some way, he's almost the hero of the film. He's the saviour. And I love the character. <laughs> you, got, you got your tongue cut out. Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, I think that's a good scene as well. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember what one came next? <laughs> it's only because my memory is a bit short. <laughs> it's an English short then. Oh, yeah, an English short. I love that as well. Yeah. That was an easy role for me. I was in bed the whole time. <laughs> you got to play Aubrey, the uh, occult, sort of strange, occult-worshipping grandfather of the Clement Hall creepy haunted house. Mm-hmm. And you got to spend most of the film in bed. Yeah, I love the fact that I had to do like a child's voice. Well, I find that scene really creepy. And I think, I tell you, every time I've done a screening of an English haunting... Every person in the room, when it comes this moment, because your character is uh, sort of like almost comatose for the whole film, when you finally, finally speak right at the end of the film, and you're sort of, it's a bit of a spoiler, but you're possessed by this child, and you speak in this child's voice, the whole room always falls silent in the screening room, always falls completely silent, and people are so tuned in to what your character's saying, so I think you really nailed that scene. Mm. I said, don't leave. But she said, you'd suspect. She said, it takes time. Time? For what? For the boy to be ready. Aubrey told her, you're the one. Then we did a very small role in Vampire Virus. Yeah. Um, where you played a... A homeless vampire. Homeless vampire. Does a particular character out of all those films stand out to you as a favourite? Oh, I've liked them all. The character of the footman in House of Violent Desire. Mm -hmm. I think your direction, that's the character that your direction most helped me with. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying your direction doesn't always help me. (laughs) But the others... I mean, I'd always say to you, what do you want him to be like? And you'd tell me. And then I'd have a pretty much a, a good idea. Mm. And we pretty much stuck to them most of the time. Yeah. But with the footman, I wasn't so sure how to play him. And that first day on set, you just said something and it, and it instantly clicked. Yeah. Because... What you said about that role, you said, oh, Barrington, you'll really get this one. I don't need to give you anything. You really get it. <laughs> Normally, before the films, you and I have a little meeting and mm. we go over the character. Mm-hmm. I don't think we did that for that one. Maybe not. And so even when I was on the first day with my costume on, I still d- didn't have the character now. My job was very cold. It was a chilly shoot, wasn't it? Yeah. It was February in the south of France. It was colder in the house than that. <laughs> well, it was a castle, so you go yeah. into the castle and it was like the atmosphere of going it into a, a cave. Fridge. It was like a fridge, yeah. It was like when you go in a cave and it's colder inside than it is on the outside. You even let me wear my fur coat for some of the scenes. Yeah, we had to, we had to chuck the fur coat on. You're talking about the cold. Have you ever been really uncomfortable on any of my sets? Yeah, all of them. And is it usually the cold? It's usually the cold, yeah. (laughs) Getting wet with the blood. (laughs) And the blood is cold. Yeah, there's something about just 
being a filmmaker in the UK is always cold. Even in the summer, it seems to be kind of cold, you know, when, when night time comes. I mean, I did a bit of filming this year in June or July, and when it got to night time, it was freezing cold. Mm. It's always cold here. Mm. So you, and when you're making horror, when you're out in the woods, uh, you're covered in fake blood, mm. it can get uncomfortable. Actually, with God will fall. Mm. I never got cold. Well, I, I think ended up with a contact lens in my eye for six months. It was actually a whole year that you had the contact lens in your eye. So I bought this contact lens, and it was a bit of a dodgy one, to be honest. <laughs> it was <Thanks>. like <laughs> nowadays I buy really good, expensive ones, but this was a bit of a dodgy one from Hong Kong or something like that. Oh, yeah. So we put this contact lens in your eye because your eye needed to appear totally white. And I remember it took like 45 minutes to get the contact lens in your eye. And then a year to get it out. <laughs> so what happened to the contact lens? Where did it go? It was it was around the back of the eye. <laughs> and it just came out. I, I went I went to the opticians. I, could, I knew it was in there. And I went to the opticians <laughs> twice. They said, no, it must be out. It must be out. It's not in here. <laughs> And then one morning, it just in the corner of my eye, there was a screwed up contact lens. <laughs> so that was a bit of a discomfort for a year. See, the human body is amazing. It gets used to things. <laughs> and it gets used to contact lenses going around the back of your eye. Yeah. <laughs> Does a particular shoot that we did together stand out as a favourite? I like the fight scene in uh, um, The Werewolves of England. It was really good, except for losing the <laughs> mask. That was a bit... When the werewolf heads got stolen. very emotional. It, re- it was, wasn't it? I mean, we were all so emotional. I, I could feel tears in the... Well, we'd arranged for this 20-day shoot, and we were down in Cornwall, and uh, it was day five, and a member of the crew stole the heads of the werewolves and nobody knew where they were and it was the only thing that could have been stolen from the set that could possibly stop Stop the filming filming. or put a delay on the filming Um, and here we were a a cast of people I love every single person in that cast I love and I've worked with all of them so many times Apart from Reese, the lead, I'd worked with everyone so many times. I'd I'd written the roles sp- specifically for people, and in some ways, it was like this awesome family reunion of getting together all these people on set for a film where I had a decent budget. We'd built this humongous set of a Victorian inn in the barn in Cornwall, and it should have been an easy ride. You know, we had the Airbnbs booked. And it was 20 solid days, everyone relaxing. It should have just been the easiest shoot. Yet we got to set one morning. This crew member, we later found out, can't prove it for sure, but we're certain that this crew member didn't want to be on our set, stole the werewolf heads. So we got to set and the werewolves were gone. And so we couldn't couldn't actually shoot the werewolf scenes. So we spent the following day searching two days two days searching in the countryside even (laughs) searching every possible place where the werewolf heads could have gone missing but in in this gigantic box that the werewolf heads were in this huge cardboard box it's not a box that could easily be misplaced and then of course people on set were quite upset you know uh, including you, I mean, we, we I remember these evenings, you, me and the rest of the cast, sitting around, and it was actually traumatic. Well, you were quiet as well, because you went to bed, you got, got into the, into Tim's camp bed in the middle of the lounge, <laughs> pulled the covers over your head, and we didn't see you for two hours. Well, I think I had a nap, a stress yeah. nap. I mean, the whole film was, I mean, I lost about seven or eight grand, of my yeah. personal money because of the werewolf head theft because mm. we had to shut down production for three weeks uh, and then come back but I suppose in a way when we came back on that film 
it was it was all the more triumphant because we were back like no one was going to stop this film from happening apart from you came back and you still never saw the werewolf heads no i never saw them <laughs> because they were not in real life they were stuck in the mail so you did this whole movie where you interact with werewolves yet you were never on set with a werewolf mm. but, uh, another you asked me about scenes i really like mm. I really liked um, Winter Skin mm-hmm. in the scene where I get my tongue cut out. Yeah. Because I think that is such a... I mean, it was fun to do, mm. but also it's so brilliant to watch. It's such an amazing scene. It's so dynamic. I'm I'm personally very, very fond of the scene in Winter Skin, that climax, that huge shootout. Yeah. I mean, I'm such, a, one. I'm such a huge Westerns fan. I've been dying to do a Western for ages and finally i mean winter skin is a film that was really inspired by westerns um if you actually look at it more than anything else it looks more like a western i it love is a western well i mean it, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a horror film with sort of a misery sort of element but my from from a stylistic and technical perspective my inspirations were Sergio Corbucci, Sergio Leone, Italian westerns. There's a western with Klaus Kinski, who you mentioned, uh, The Great Silence. Klaus mm. Kinski plays this bounty hunter. Yeah, um, it's, it's a brilliant film. It's one of my favourite westerns, and it's a western that's unique because it's set in the snow. Mm. And that was an inspiration for Winter Skin. So finally, we got to do this big western shootout, which, even though it only takes sort of a couple of minutes in the film, we shot this western shootout over the space three of three days, mm. maybe even four days. Might have been four, yeah. But um, it was really uh, difficult. And I get my tongue cut out. You get your tongue cut out. Uh, there was, in fact, in the in the script of the film, there was going to be a whole other scene where you had a discussion with your tongue cut out. Yeah, and I was really looking forward to that. You were, but um, after three or four days of shooting. I was really just like, we need to just bloody end this scene. This scene's going on and on and on, and it's going to take us forever. So we just had the baddie character get shot in the head. Mm. Aside from my movies, you've also, you have actually been in a fair few like Hollywood level productions. Yeah. What are some of the Hollywood films you've been in? Um... Got to get the brain going again. <laughs> Star Wars, Robin Hood. And these are the remakes, yeah. This is the yeah. new Star Wars yeah. and the new Clash of the Titans yeah. with Sam Worthington and um, The Mummy with Tom Cruise. Oh, yeah, that was just one scene. In that. Robin Hood with Russell Crowe. Yeah. How'd you get on with Russell Crowe? Oh. <laughs> I had a run in with him. <laughs> yeah. I said to him, hey mate, there's your spot. <laughs> he was not on his mark. He was not on his mark. <laughs> and the technicians have told me to remind him when he came that that was his mark. They made a mark for him. <laughs> yeah. And I said, hey, hey mate, you're in the wrong spot. He said, the spot's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't move. You so had to reset all the cameras. <laughs> Okay, the last two questions I always ask everyone on my podcast is what is a film that inspired you in some way or influenced you in some way? I think Tarkovsky's, there's several Tarkovsky's, there's Sacrifice, Stalker, Mm -hmm. there's another one where he sets fire to a whole house Mm -hmm. and he does set fire to the house, you can see it's not a model, you can see it's a house. Yeah. Ingemar Bergman's Seventh Seal was a big influence for me, but I like the avant-garde as well. I like, I suppose my, the, what I'm attracted to is films that have meaning, that say something. Yeah. I mean, I think Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs were both brilliant films because they explored mm. violence, not for violence's sake, but, but they explored the meaning of violence. Mm. Films that explore. Films that are not in the comfort zone. Yeah. Films that take a risk. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for films that put you out of your comfort zone, show you something new, 
bring a new element into your sort of thinking. I think Fargo is a film that makes you think as well. That's a brilliant film. Yeah. And in fact... I like the Coen brothers. I think they're... The Coen brothers are... Yeah, like like Tarantino and David Lynch, the Coen brothers are another group of filmmakers who who really had a massive influence on me. And that Lost sort of, Highway, David Lynch. Lost Highway. That's my yeah, favourite, David Lynch. Yeah, those two are my two favourites. Yeah. yeah. Mulholland Drive is fantastic, uh, and Lost Highway has, over the years, become even more of a favourite than Mulholland yeah. Drive. But I think that's David Lynch at his absolute best. Yeah, me too. Um, and the other thing I've asked you is a fellow creative working in this independent industry that you'd like to give a mention to. Well, there's Christos Fedaras, whose music I've used for several of my short films mm-hmm. and for my performances. He's a, he's a brilliant musician. Well, Barrington. On that note. On that note, thanks for taking the time to speak to me about all of our movies together and hopefully many more to come. Yeah, great. Brilliant. Once again, thanks for listening to the show. You can now follow Barrington on Instagram and you can visit his website, barringtondelaroche.com, to see his artworks and paintings. Our movies together are available to buy in various countries. Almost all of them are on DVD in America. But wherever you are, just go onto Amazon and type Barrington De La Roche or even my name, Charlie Steeds, and you'll find a whole bunch of DVDs and movies to stream where you can watch Barrington do his thing. And you can count on seeing Barrington show up in new roles in my upcoming Dark Temple movies, as I know the films just wouldn't be the same without him.